so many people this evening who have said, oh, <laughs> what a day, what a week, what a, yeah, whatever. And Lord, I just want y'all to know that I had that day too, and God is bigger. You know, Jesus is bigger. When we talk about Jesus, when we do, I had my phone read me the chapters, several chapters actually, and a bunch of psalms today while I was working because the mind, right? We need to take care of that ground. We cannot see that ground to our emotions and to our nasty thoughts about how it feels today or whatever. And, you know, God is good. Jesus is good even when it feels not what we want. You know, even when things aren't going the way we think they should, even when it isn't fair, you know, it isn't good, it's still okay because God's going to lose control. He's allowing something to happen and he will use it if we'll stay where we need to be. So, you know, we both, we all have to universally kind of pull up and say, Jesus, we believe what you said. You know, just like the disciples, I was thinking about the disciples a little today, too. And I was thinking, you know, they didn't understand. And we always kind of go, well, they couldn't really because it's a new thing and they wouldn't have. But sometimes I don't think I understand. Same thing, right? I'm going through all this stuff. And right now, somebody earlier said hi and I started almost crying. So, like, that's the kind of day, right? <laughs> and, but there's so many tentacles. There's so many pieces of things, right? But the thing is, God will use every single one of them if I can just keep myself where I need to be. You know, it's when I move off to the side or start to try to fix it, <laughs> that's when it all goes away. That's when it all blows up. It's when I can say, God, it isn't me, it's you. Maybe I get a little closer to understanding what he really wants. You know what I mean? Because I wouldn't got it either. Not then, and I still don't get it now some days. But I just know that I can only find one true north, you know, no matter what else is going on. That's you. Father, thank you. Thank you that on the good days, you are good. And on the hard days, you are bigger. And that all days, we can rejoice in you. Because we know where we're going, and we know who loves us, and we are not alone. God, it doesn't always work the way we like. And the world is challenging right now. And it just kind of feels heavy on to a lot of us. But God, I thank you that you are still good. You are still God. And you have not lost control. You, have, you are holding us up. And we can rejoice just like you told us to. Even today. Because you are good. And you are good. And we love you. Teach us everything you want us to know for Mark tonight. And thank you for Hannah. And bless her as she teaches. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, this is the next to last lesson that we're going to have for the semester. And so we've got one more after tonight. And then we will take a six-week break and pick back up in January. But tonight, we're, um, I want to start with something kind of fun. And I want to just take a look at a couple of optical illusions. What do you see there? You see a base. Or you see two faces. <coughs> What about that? Do you see a rabbit? Or do you see a duck first? Duck. duck. You see a rabbit there too. <laughs> and then do you see here a profile of an old woman? Or do you see the backside of a young girl? I don't see the old woman at all. Uh, oh, there she is. Okay. The old, old woman too? Her nose? Yeah, this I is saw her it. nose and her mouth. The young girl with the hat oh, like yeah. in the yep. <laughs> And then the last one, just because we're not the first ones to come up with optical illusions, this is a carving from hundreds of years ago. Do you see an elephant or do you see a bull? Uh -huh. I believe the elephant, this is a little harder. This is the trunk of the elephant here in his tusk, and the bull's head is up oh, there. Wow. See that? Right? So those are fun, right? But the point here is things are not always as they seem, right? Sometimes you look at something one way and you see something and then you look at it a little bit further and you see something different. And that's the lesson we're kind of gonna to see today in the uh, part of Mark that we're into. We're up to chapter nine and this is the third of four lessons on what it means to be a disciple. How can we really truly be followers of Jesus? And we've been digging in the text here and finding out what Jesus is saying to us and what we can see from this event and the other events that tells us 
um, how we can follow Jesus more faithfully. And so it, the last time we were here, Jesus was telling his disciples, he was like, uh, in very plain words, this is what's going to happen to me. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be pain. There's going to be betrayal. And, there's and the plot against him by the religious leaders is going to appear to be successful. And he was going to be killed. He says, it's plain out. You know, it's not hidden, not parables anymore. He's just saying it's, too, it's straight up. And, but he then says that's not where the story is going to stop. After three days, I'm going to rise. Now, the disciples could not imagine this happening. They got stuck on the one part of the picture that they could see one way. They just couldn't imagine what it meant for the Messiah to suffer and die. And so they couldn't see the picture any other way. They could only focus in on one thing. And at the end of chapter 8 last time, we saw that Jesus winds out his teaching. He's not just talking to the 12 disciples anymore. He says, he goes to all of his disciples who are following, and he said, this is what it means to follow me. That is a way of self-denial, submission, and obedience. That's what we saw at the end of chapter 8 and verse 34. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And we've worked through what that actually meant last time. So this wasn't sidebar teaching for the 12. This was the whole group that he was saying this to. And so these things are not optional for, uh, for followers of Jesus. It's the main path. Remember that there is no Christianity without sacrifice. There isn't. First his and then ours, right? So if that's not a popular teaching. It's not people, what people want to hear, uh, but it's the truth. And, you know, when you usually when you hear the message in the scriptures talking about or, or from the pulpit or in books or a podcast or whatever, talking about what Jesus does for you and you are the focus, then you're off track because the scriptures and everything is about Jesus. He, the cross is central. Christ is the focus. And you cannot bypass sacrifice. You just can't do it. You can't get around that. But if you remember from last time. That's not where it ends. We moved on to uh, chapter 9, verse 1, which we saw that connected to last time. He tells us that uh, some are standing here are not going to taste death before they see the kingdom of God coming with power. And we talked about several options about what that meant. But um, uh, really the point is that we took away from it was this, there's a promise as well. It's not just a life of suffering and sacrifice. That one day it's all going to be straightened out and we will reign with him. That's the promise. And see the kingdom of God coming with power. So that leads us up to the day section in uh, starting in chapter 9. And we're going to move on to verse 2. And we see just six days later, Jesus, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up to a high mountain. Now, a lot of really interesting things and important things happen in, on mountains, right? Um, if you go all the way back to the, the Genesis... Uh, to Genesis, you see Abraham took Isaac to sacrifice him on a mountain. The Ten Commandments were given on a mountain. Uh, uh, if you know the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, that happened on Mount Carmel. Uh, Jesus taught on the Mount of Olives, and of course the crucifixion took, took place on a mountain too. So uh, then we get out, if we add to what we get here, Luke tells us that. The reason he went up there was to pray, and this amazing event the called the Transfiguration happens as he was praying. And he, so he was transfigured and he was changed while he was uh, praying, to the Lord, uh, praying to the Father, and his face changed and his clothes became bright like lightning. Matthew tells us that his face shone like the sun, and his clothes were also changed. And then back in Mark, we learned that his clothes were dazzling white. Uh, whiter than you could get them with bleach. So uh, what happens here is that the true nature of Jesus shines forth in this amazing moment right here. So up until this point, point Jesus' true nature has been veiled by the flesh, and it broke through this, this moment as the glory of God was visible for a brief moment, right? Now, this wasn't a new miracle, right? What it really was was a temporary pause and an ongoing miracle. Right? Because we're so familiar with the man Jesus when we're reading the Gospels, we forget about the resplendent glory that he possesses. And so he walked around on the earth for 33 years, and that glory was kept hidden, and that was the real miracle. 
that, that it was clothed behind flesh for all that time. So in this moment, the true nature of Jesus just burst forth for just a little bit. And that miracle of the incarnation is paused and his true beauty shines through for these three guys. So why this glory revealing moment at this moment uh, in time? Why not earlier? Why not later? Why even have it at all? So let's kind of walk through this passage and, and as we do, draw out some lessons uh, for us as disciples. And there are lessons from the transfiguration, but they're going to teach us some things about being disciples. And the first one is that disciples are prepared by Christ for what's ahead through this moment. So remember, he's just told them in plain language, this is what's going to happen, suffering, death. Uh, and, and this was also the responsibility for everybody who follows after him. And they need to choose voluntarily uh, uh, the way of suffering and death. So this is a disturbing moment for these guys, right? I mean, everything they have believed about what Messiah was going to be is being undone and turned upside down. And not only is Jesus not going to overthrow Rome right in this moment and take his place as king, he's talking about death for himself and his followers, a.k.a. Then. I mean, so this is a this is upsetting to them, and so this big reveal moment that we have here at the Transfiguration is going to prepare them to weather some really hard stuff that comes not only up coming up to the crucifixion and resurrection, but all after he ascends and they begin to establish the new church. So uh, now they're not going to get this right all the way to the end. We're going to see coming up right right after this that they get. They get off track again, so it's going to take a little bit for them to understand what's going on. And But this moment gives them the assurance that they haven't believed in vain, that Jesus is displaying his glory as the king in this moment. So the disciples knew, hey, he knows what he's doing, and we can trust that. So uh, what it did was his transfiguration was aimed at strengthening their faith in anticipation of the coming uh, uh, crucifixion and his, this ascent onto this high mountain prepares them for his ascent to Calvary. And now remember, these three men are going to be crucial in the establishment of church over in the book of Acts and beyond. Peter, Peter is going to uh, uh, preach the inaugural message that at, at, at Pentecost and thousands are going to respond to this message. He's going to become a key leader in the church and teach us lessons about accepting the Gentiles into the church. And he's, of course, going to write two New Testament uh, books. John, we know him pretty, pretty well, too. He writes one of the Gospels later. He's the key leader in the church of Ephesus. And he's going to go on to write not only the Gospel, but three other epistles. And, of course, the last book of the Bible, the book of the Revelation, where he uh, gives us the encouragement that we draw from about what the future is going to be. Now, not a lot is known about James, except that he was one of the first disciples to be martyred. He's the only one in the New Testament that records his death, but he was certainly a leader in the early church as well. So uh, they're going to be used mightily, and we see what John wrote, uh, referencing back to this event, no doubt. John 1, 14 says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, no doubt, talking about this moment right here. In 2 Peter 1, 16 and 18, he talks specifically about the transfiguration. He said, we are eyewitnesses of his majesty. And so um, what he says that, and this is, so he, in the same way as he was preparing the disciples for what was going to happen in their lives, even though they weren't fully able to grasp it at that moment, uh, being certain of Christ's full identity for us prepares us for our difficult moments as well. Right? Um, if we know it for certain that Jesus is not just a good man, Jesus is not just this wise teacher, that we're convinced that he's the Son of God, which, by the way, is the whole point of the book of Mark. If you remember all the way back to chapter 1, verse 1, that's what Mark is telling us. Jesus is the Son of God. So we're convinced of that. Uh, then what does it do when you hit a rough, rough patch? Right? It undergirds you strengthens you and it helps you face whatever comes your way with resolve 
right? Knowing Christ's true nature, being convinced of that, assures us that he is more than capable of handling whatever we face, whether it's big or whether it's small, and whether it turns out the way we want it to or not, right? So sometimes he will be so kind to us as to give kind of us these mountaintop experiences and help us experience him personally a little bit better too, right? Most of you probably had that when you're at a conference or reading a book or a prayer or talking to somebody that you just feel you God is revealing something to you. And these are kind of these moments that we can hold on to and help us get through the dry seasons if we hold on to the lessons that they teach us. So we talked about journaling before a couple of weeks ago, and this is another reason to write things down, right? Because the, the enemy is always snatching stuff from us. He wants us to forget. He wants us to not know uh, with certainty about what we believe. And so he will use forgetfulness and he'll use the passage of time to uh, get that away from us so we start to doubt. And so write things down so you can open up your journal and you can look back and say, oh yeah, I remember that time. And it can remind us of and give us that unwavering certainty uh, to face our crucial moments, our difficult moments with faithfulness. And so uh, we're prepared for what's by ahead. We're also uh, disciples maintain an all of the Holy One of God. And so we're going to go on to Mark chapter 9, verse 4. And so if uh, the radiant glow of Jesus is not enough, there also appeared these two Old Testament guys, Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Now, why these two guys? Uh, most commentators agree that they are, uh, represent the law, that is Moses, and Elijah, that is the prophets, and uh, they are bearing witness to who Jesus is as the prophesied Messiah. So say, you're saying Jesus perfectly fulfilled all the law represented by Moses and fulfilled all of the prophecies about Messiah represented by Elijah. And so it's interesting that they were talking together here and the sense construction here in the original language indicates that it went on for a while. So it wasn't just, hey, hi, how ya, and it was, you know, two minutes and it was over. Luke uh, 9, uh, 31 tells us about what they talked about. And it says they spoke about his departure, that is Jesus, which he was about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. So it wasn't just a catch-up time. It was talking specifically about what was going to happen in the next six months. And um, <clears throat> so there's this protracted discussion that goes on about what's happening and now, can you imagine eavesdropping on that conversation? I mean, you're just like listening to what's going on there. Who would ever think to interrupt, right? Peter. Peter. <laughs> Peter did, right? And Luke says that it was at the end of the conversation, so at least he had the good sense to wait that long. But Mark, uh, uh, the first five and six in Mark 9 says, uh, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, for Moses and Elijah, and then verse 6 gives us his motivation. He didn't know what to say because he was so frightened. And uh, so some of this chattering away by Peter is understandably out of fear. I mean, uh, but there is a time to shut up and be quiet, and this would have been a good one. But he doesn't. So, But, cause, but sometimes what you really think, or what you're really thinking when you get in a highly emotional state really comes out, right? I mean, it's like the filters are all gone, and so you so you just blurt out something. And so the thing about these, these shelters that he's talking about is saying that, you know, maybe, why don't y'all stay for a little longer? Maybe he was saying that. Or maybe he knew that this was a significant enough visitation that what he wanted to do was memorialize it. That is, let's put up these shelters and we can come back here and visit and make it like a, a monument of some sort. Or maybe he said that uh, he saw putting up the three shelters, three of the same kind of shelters, that he misunderstood that Jesus was not just one of these, the three, he was supreme above them. And he had missed the point of the visitation, and that is the grasp, the uniqueness of and the overarching supremacy of Christ. But what here's what enters, ends Peter's interruption, and that is a cloud appeared and enveloped him. Now, this is the same cloud as you see in the Old Testament when the cloud of God would descend on, on the temple, the Shekinah glory of God. This is that. 
And uh, he said he appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. So uh, this is a vision we kind of need to keep in our minds today. It's because there's a lot of emphasis in the church on Jesus being your friend and your companion. And uh, that's certainly what Jesus does call us his companions. But uh, um, he is, is the one that sticks closer than a brother. But that never puts us on the same level. <laughs> you know, him calling us your companions doesn't raise us up to his level nor bring Jesus down to our level, right? He has always been in the past, is present, and forever and always be the Lord God Creator Almighty. He, that, his, his, his unique character, who he is, that never, ever changes. He is the sustainer of all things. And that's what we need to remember that. It is such a privilege for us to be able to talk to him, and he causes his companion, but that does not erase who he is. We need to realize and keep that awe of who God is. So let's break this down a little bit further. So disciples seek their approval from God. And that's verse 7. This is my son whom I love. Now we heard the same basic thing uh, in chapter 1 during Jesus' baptism, a, a, an audible voice approving uh, coming from the Father from heaven that says, You're my son, whom I love, and I'm in you I am well pleased. That's Mark 117. And so here we have another audible voice from the uh, from the heavens, and, and uh, <clears throat> that it assured the disciples that this gruesome death that was coming and that the Jew, that the Jews would outright re reject him, they reminded them that Jesus is that's not what the most true thing. That Jesus, even though it's going to look like it goes really, really badly here, that Jesus has the approval of the Father. And so when it comes to us today, what we can take away from this is where we draw our significance from, right? My goodness, this is a message that we need to understand and receive as believers in Jesus today. Did you know that if you are joined with Jesus, if you are a believer in Jesus, you have the approval of God too? You have the approval of God. So we tend to look at our failures and our faults and our shortcomings, and we make those the most important thing, right? We give them too much weight. Yes, we need to work and strive toward holiness. We need to re repent of sin. We need to walk in the way that God leads us to. And, but you cannot be more accepted by God than you are right now at this moment. On your worst day, on your best day. His approval does not change. And, uh, and so that we need, we need to remember that because it needs to resonate as the most important thing in our thinking, right? But how often is that the truth, right? The normal way we look for identity is that we either look inward and see what our feelings tell us, see what our past tells us, See how we listen to the voices of our flesh and the enemy of the world, and we look at those things, and that's where we say, this is what my identity should be. And that's always shifting and changing, right? Your emotions are up one day and down the next and around. And so <laughs> that doesn't tell us what our true identity is. Or we look outward at things around us to our jobs, our families, our material possessions, our, uh, our reputation, or all these outside things, and we go, that's where I draw my identity from. I need all this out here to tell me who I am. But if you put your identity on things like success or wealth or power or physical appearance or any of those things out there, you are setting yourself up for a huge disappointment because a sudden job loss, what does that do to your identity then? Or if, how about a piece of gossip aimed at you, whether it's true or not? What does that do to your identity then? Well, your appearance changes as we get older, right? We can't change, we can't fix that. And some people say nice things about you. And some people don't say very nice things about you, right? So, but God, however, is unchanging. He is reliable. He is the same yesterday. 
and today and forever. And if you find your and root your identity in him, you will never ultimately be let down because he has proven time and time and time again that he is trustworthy. So your, your identity should never be based on a hope or a guess. God gave you the word, his Bible, so you can know him and you can know who he's making you into, in him, to be. And I uh, worked up a sheet on the back, uh, stand back there, which is, uh, has a whole list of things that the Bible tells you about who you are in Christ. And I hope you will take one of those, and I hope that during our break over the, over the Christmas and Thanksgiving break, that you will look, actually look those verses up. Read what they say about you and then tuck that thing in your Bible or something, put it on your refrigerator or wherever. And when you feel unsure, read that. It's because that's what the truth is. Your feelings are not the truth. And the world is not the truth. That is the truth. And the way to walk in holiness and walk in faithfulness is truth over lies. Truth over lies. It is not feelings. You don't have to feel any way about that whole list right there. I mean, it is the truth. You believe it. So when you have a thought that is not in keeping with that, that goes away and truth goes over the top of it. That's how you change how you think about yourself. You need God to take what the word says and apply it to yourself. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says that through our relationship with Jesus, all things are what? Passed away. Behold, all things are new, Right? That's what the love of Jesus does for it. That's what the acceptance of Jesus does for it. And the entire Bible is a testimony to the extraordinary lengths God went to, has gone to, to release you from your past. Stop dragging it around like a ball and chain. He says, cut loose from that. Walk in the newness that is yours. And if we embrace this truth that we are wholly loved, completely loved by God without reservation, it has the power to change the path you are on and gives us a vision to live a new life with a forward-looking focus focused on Him. That is the truth, ladies. Change the way you think. You can do that. The power of the Holy Spirit within you enables you to do it. And if we choose not to, that's a choice that we're making. So I encourage you, if you have trouble with who I am, how you believe about yourself, start with that list. Look them up. Read them. Get them into your mind and get them in your heart. Mm -hmm. It's the power to change everything about how you see yourself. And so, um, next thing, disciples learn to listen to Jesus. And that's what we see in the back half of verse 7 here. It says, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Now, a couple things here. Notice that the voice does not say, listen to Moses. That is the Mosaic law. It does also not say, listen to Elijah, by extension the prophets, and heed their voice. Now, does that mean these writings are no longer important? Absolutely not. We need to stop looking at the Old Testament and the New Testament as two separate things. They are a singular story. It's like a chapter of a book. It's like chapter 1 and chapter 2. You cannot understand chapter 2 without reading chapter 1. This is what helps us understand the faith that we walk in. So don't just say I'm a New Testament Christian, Christian and I only read the New Testament. You are missing so much richness and so much depth. We need both of them. But, and then Matthew tells us, he says, don't, Jesus, what Jesus said, don't think I've come abolish the law and the prophets. He's not casting away the Old Testament. He says, I've come, I'm not abolishing them, but I'm fulfilling them. It's a crucial difference to see there. And uh, so when it says, listen to him, that, uh, that does not mean hear sound waves with your ears. That means obey. Okay, just read James. That, he'll, he'll tell you that in plain English. And we talked about this last time, but this calls for us to make a voluntary decision to follow. Jesus is not going to make you do it. You can sit in a pew and never follow at all. But he says, as a true disciple, make a voluntary choice to follow. And, uh, and there really aren't any qualifiers here about what we're supposed to listen to Jesus, right? I mean, it says it's not when it's convenient. It's not when I already agree with what he says. It's not when it makes sense. It's not when it's easy. 
It's not when it benefits you. It is listen to him and then do. Follow through on what he says. Now, we don't have the voice of God from heaven telling us what to do, but you know how you hear him? By opening up the scriptures, by opening up the word of God. I heard somebody a long time ago who says, says, if you want to hear God speak, read your Bible. If you want to hear him speak audibly, read it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> this is the word of God and it is written down in black and white for you so you don't have to remember it right it's written right there open it up and read it and so since he has clearly spoken about his will in the pages of the Bible always start there you want to know what God has to say get in the Bible and read and it says don't be concerned about it if you don't understand every single passage or every single thing that's said there there's enough in there that's easy and plain to understand start with those you don't worry about all that oh I don't know about this thing in you know the uh, you know second Samuel I don't know this thing about in Deuteronomy start with the, some of the things that are plain like be kind tender-hearted forgiving one another just as God in Christ Jesus forgave you now you don't need to do a word study on <laughs> you can understand that what your response is to people who hurt you. Be kind. Be tenderhearted. Forgiving one another, just as God in Christ Jesus forgave you. Okay? So how did God forgive you in Christ? Fully and completely, without reservation. That's how we forgive. So we don't have to worry about how to you know, start with those easy verses. Now I didn't say they're easy to apply. I said they're easy to understand. Now, application of that can be really, really hard, right? But, you know, there is a lot of the Bible is plain and simple. And it's like now you need to ask for the Holy Spirit to guide you in how to apply that. But uh, start by being diligent and applying what you do understand. The Holy Spirit will take care of teaching you. Remember, he's our teacher, right? The things that you might not understand. So uh, experiences come and go, recollection of past it, it, experiences, they'll fail, but God's word never changes. And it's right there for your reference anytime you forget. So uh, just kind of an expansion on this is that, um, oh, I forgot to tell you that. This is really important too, but John 1, 17 reminds us that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So he did, God is once again, Jesus is not once again abolishing that, <laughs> the law came through him, but grace and truth is what Jesus brought to us. Now, what, what is grace? Grace is getting what you don't deserve, right? That's what Jesus did for us. We all deserve being cast into the lake of fire away from Jesus, away from God forever. But he brought grace, and he brought truth, and that's what he reminds us of. And then another lesson from the transfiguration, disciples obey even when we don't understand. And so the, the, the glory moment is over, and they were alone, and they were coming down from the mountain. Jesus gave them orders to not tell anybody what they'd seen until the Son of Man had been risen from the dead. And it says they kept the matter to themselves and discussed what rising from the dead meant. So the summit on the mountain is concluded, and the disciples have learned, despite his earthly outward appearance, that Jesus is really God, right? They've seen it, and this transfiguration proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that that is absolutely true. And this amazing moment, Jesus commands them to keep quiet. Now, uh, he says, don't tell anybody else. Don't even tell the other disciples. Now, um, imagine you are got these guys. Your first question is, why not? Why can't we tell some people about this amazing myth? moment. I mean, you just saw Jesus in his resplendent, his resplendent glory and were enveloped by the cloud of God. You heard the Father speak and then Jesus went, shh. Don't tell anybody. Wow. That's <laughs> hard, right? I mean, think about something you've seen or heard or been involved in and somebody says, I don't need you to tell anybody about that. And this is some amazing thing. Now, what do you do? You go home and call your mom, right? Or your sister or your best friend and go, not supposed to tell anybody, but <laughs> and then we tell them, right? <laughs> now, why did Jesus say this? Why did he say, I don't want you to tell anybody? Um, well, remember, the crowds are already crushing in on him, the excitement is swarming in the masses about what's happening here, but they are just as misinformed about what Messiah is supposed to be as the disciples are, or of the Pharisees that the Pharisees are. They're looking for a king, not a suffering sacrifice. So 
should the word get out about this glory revealing moment here, uh, the fervor would have just continued and got even, uh, whipped up into a more frenzy. Now later this revelation is going to be really important. We already saw that both Peter and John reference it in their letters. But it's not until after the crucifixion and the resurrection that that's going to take place. And it's really not until Paul begins to write the epistles that we really understand what's going on with the crucifixion and the resurrection anyway. And so instead of helping with understanding, this mass knowledge of the, uh, of the transfiguration would have only bring, brought more confusion. And that's why they need to be quiet about it. That, that probably made little sense to them at the moment. It must have seemed to them that sharing what happened here would have helped the program move along a little faster. Hey, you're going to come in. You're gonna, I mean, how's Rome going to stand up to that? Right? They're going to see you as, as the, uh, you know, the revealed God. There's no way Rome can stand up to that. But even after this experience, they had the good sense not to say anything, even with their lack of understanding. Uh, now, that seemed like a really huge thing to follow, but sometimes keeping our mouths shut can be hard, right? I mean, James talks about that too. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but whether it's keeping quiet or something else, there are the commands of God don't always make human sense to us. But we need to learn to obey anyway, right? It's been that way ever since the very beginning of the world. Now, for example, the very first story in the Bible, Adam and Eve were told not to eat from the fruit of the tree in the center of the garden, right? And this seemed unreasonable to them. Not only did the fruit look appetizing, but the idea of being able to increase in knowledge, that's not a bad thing, right? I mean, that seemed attractive enough. So God's first command seems to forbid something that's good, right? No other, no other explanation from God, just don't eat of it. And surprise, they used their own reasoning power, listened to the voice of the devil, and things went really bad because they disobeyed. And maybe you can hear them saying, but, 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 but God, if you'd only explained it to me, if you'd only told me what was going to happen, then I would have followed, right? Just give me an explanation. That's all I want. But you know what? God does not, rarely chooses to explain himself, what he wants from us is us to trust him, okay? He doesn't sit you down at the table and say, now this is the reason I want you to do that. He just says, trust me. Trust me and obey. And we choose to obey only when we have understanding that is not what God wants. Jesus didn't want to have this long discussion with the disciples on the way down the mountain about why it was important for them to keep their mouths shut. He just wanted them to obey and trust him. That's it. So remember, agreement, when we have everything explained to us, is not obedience. Obedience, only when we are in agreement, means that our real master is our own understanding. Right? Not God. Okay? Real obedience arises from when we are able to trust and obey and follow, even when we don't get all the explanations that we want. We're saying by that, God, I know that you know more than me. <laughs> and even when this doesn't make rational sense to me, but I trust you. So we have something that conflicts with reason. It doesn't seem like it makes sense to us, but you know God is speaking to you. Obey anyway. Obey anyway. See, godly obedience means trusting the unexplained commands of God no matter how strongly our heart says, eh, I don't know, I don't know, or our culture disagrees, or our feelings rebel, or our desires so overwhelm us. Obey anyway. Obedience means making God the Lord of our lives. That means he makes the rules and we say yes. And the essence of worship is not the songs we sing at the beginning of a church service, right? Worship, became, uh, worship begins when we declare with our actions, not just our words, what we actually do, what we actually do in our lives, we declare your ways, not mine. Amen? God, we just thank you that uh, you make something so simple and plain. And even when we're confused and we don't understand, God, 
You have shown us enough about yourself that we can trust you. We can trust you. God, give us the faith to step out and follow you wherever you lead. God, help us not lean on our intellect or on what other people are saying or what the culture says is, is good. God, help us to trust you and follow through and know that you will never change and you never let us down. And God, we pray, pray in the powerful name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.